We pick up the Beatles' trajectory in May of 1963, as their meteoric rise continues to gather pace and their records sell in their thousands. On the 2nd of May, the Beatles reach what is widely considered to be their first number one UK single, with Love Me Do. Nine days later, their debut Please Please Me Long Player reached the number one spot in the album charts on the 11th of May. This is when Beatlemania came early to our household, when my father brought home the album. The record was played non-stop, with I saw us standing there being a favourite. Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley Band and the Beatles' first LP. This is English poet, novelist and librarian Philip Larkin's ironic statement about the sexual revolution as it got underway in England before invading America. The release of the Beatles' Please Please Me album was timed perfectly for their third package tour, this time supporting yet another American singer, Roy Orbison, which started on the 18th of May. Poor old Roy having to put up with the screaming Beatles fans at his shows. The fact was, by the time Orbison arrived in the UK, his one-time opening band had surpassed him in popularity. In a concession to audience demands, Orbison graciously agreed to share co-billing and to let the Beatles close the show each night. They didn't come to my town on this tour, but they did play three other Granada cinemas elsewhere in the UK. Meanwhile, one day before the Roy Orbison Beatles tour ends, Secretary of State for War John Perfumo admits misleading Parliament and resigns over his affair with Christine Keeler on the 8th of June. As a result, opinion polls put Labour ahead and on course to win the next general election. Still reeling from the Perfumo sex spy scandal, Harold Macmillan's Conservative government had to deal with Kim Philby being named on the 1st of July as the third man in the Burgess and Maclean spy ring. Later in 1979, art historian Anthony Blunt, surveyor of the Queen's Pictures and director of the Courtauld Institute of Art, would be identified as the fourth man of the Cambridge spy ring and be stripped of his knighthood and academic honours. The traditional seaside holiday show may be part of a British culture that is slowly dying. But back in the summer of 1963, thanks to Arthur Howes, one of the biggest promoters of pop package shows in his time, holiday makers had a chance to see the Beatles plus support acts from Epstein's NEM stable. Some of the seaside venues were part of the same cinema theatre chain infrastructure, where audience saw the Fab Four perform on previous tours supporting big name acts. Now, with the increase in record sales and TV appearances, the Beatles topped the bill of the family targeted seaside summer shows. In July, Dr. Stephen Ward stood in the witness box of the Old Bailey, charged with five counts of living off immoral earnings, what later turned out to be a trumped-up charge that he was acting as a pimp and receiving money from Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis. The jury found him guilty, but he was not there to hear the verdict. Ward was in a coma when the sentence was passed, having taken an overdose of sleeping tablets. He died three days later. At around 3am on the 8th of August 1963, a gang of armed criminals boarded a Royal Mail train en route to Euston Station in London. Dangerous and organised, they escaped with a staggering £2.6 million. That's £50 million in today's money. Up until this time, Britain had a proud record of operating a vast railway network without a major robbery. The robbery stunned the nation because of the enormous amount of money stolen. 
few years before the Beatles arrived on the scene, Britain's cinema theatre chains provided the backbone of venues that brought American rock and rollers, such as Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent, as well as Britain's own Elvis Presley, Cliff Richard, to British audiences. Cinema theatre names such as Odeon, ABC, Gaumont and Granada opened their doors to Britain's teenagers, who were eager to escape a grey world and see their idols perform live on the stages of the glamorous palaces. Born to a Jewish family, Cindy Bernstein with his brother Cecil created a successful circuit of 60 cinemas and theatres throughout England. Granada and Gaumont cinemas helped to provide the infrastructure for beat boom package tours that brought the Beatles to audiences across the UK. Despite being a communist, Bernstein was recruited to the newly formed Ministry of Information. In 1944, he became head of the film section of the Psychological Warfare Division, attached to Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. The Ministry's function was to promote the national case to the public at home and abroad in time of war, by issuing national propaganda and controlling news and information. Bernstein was believed to be a Soviet informer prior to World War II, according to MI5. The small TV screen in British homes eventually took over from the cinema screens, and half of Britain's cinemas closed during the 1960s. With the advent of television pop shows, it was much cheaper for teenagers to watch their favourite idols on TV rather than pay for expensive concert tickets, as the subsequent to touring package pop shows became loss makers. Neither the beat boom or pop show package tours that zigzagged across the country's towns, nor their use as bingo halls could save the cinema theatres, be they grand old picture palaces or the run-down flea pits that offered reduced ticket prices in return for uncomfortable seating. Thankfully, the media moguls had their television franchises and independent networks, and a growing teenage population of adoring fans eager to watch their idols from their parents' living rooms. <laughs>